as the sun sets to mark the end of the summer season. It is also marking the beginning of the only season of the year with two names. Some call it fall, while others call it autumn. Ironically, this period between summer and winter was once known as harvest. Many consider this season the most beautiful of the four. Also in the fall, a very special sport starts its season. That sport is cross country. Hello, my name is Walt Green and I will be narrating this 10 part film from the first person point of view. This is part four, which includes cross country 101, inner city cross country, clubs cross country history and sponsored events along with other distance running information. This part will also include interviews from Bill Bernard Baldwin Wallace College, Vernon Bruce Bell, Norview, Jane Canone, Maury High School, Camp Anderson, Norfolk State University, Chick Rebel, Virginian Pilot Sports Editor, Randy Cook, Maury High School, Chris Jernigan, Norview High School, Byron Cherry, Norfolk State University, Sarah Seacrest, Maury High School, Alpha McGloom, Norview High School. Carol Wood, Maury High School. Donald Bond, Lake Tahoe High School. Bob Jennings, Norview High. Cross Country has some of the most popular slogans, such as Cross Country, the sport you don't play. Another one, Cross Country is the sport, the rest are games. And still the all time classic, our sport is your sports punishment. First, some basic information from Cross Country 101, including the season, rules, team, scoring, the course, recruitment, training, and spectators. Cross country competition season starts around early September and concludes with state championship meets in November and national championship meets in December. Cross country is a very simple sport with few rules. In the 96 page NHFS rule book, only eight pages are needed for cross country. We will explain some of these rules in the next three topics, starting with team. Cross country is truly a team sport regardless of what you may have heard. A complete cross country team consists of seven runners with only the top five accounting for the scoring. The other two runners have a role that we will explain later. Some schools have large teams and certain meets will allow them to enter more than seven runners. However, they still must declare the seven runners eligible for scoring prior to the race. In championship meets, a team can only enter seven runners to compete. In cross country, the low score wins. Each runner score is based on their place, such as one point for first place, eight points for eighth place, and so on. Each team then adds the place of their top five finishers, and the sum is the team score. For example, in this dual meet between Noor and View, the View team top five runners finish first, second, fifth, 11th, and 12th, which totals 31 points. And the Noor team runners finish third, fourth, sixth, seventh, and eighth, which equals 28 points. Therefore, Noor wins the meet by a score of 28 to 31. Again, low score wins. The concept is the same whether it's two teams or 20 teams. The team sixth and seventh runners are important also. If there is a tie, the tiebreaker is determined by the higher sixth place finisher. Also, they can displace another team score. And back to the example. The only reason Noor won because their sixth and seventh runners displace Views fourth and fifth runners. This is how the score would have looked without the displacement and changed the winner of the meet. Strong teams have seven good runners. Cross country meets are held on courses known by the name of their location. The standard race distance is 3.1 miles for high school boys and girls. The best courses include grass, gravel lanes, and trails, which wind over hills through stands of trees. Even though the distance is the same, no two cross country courses are alike. The course is the biggest factor that separates cross country from other sports. In basketball, the rim is 10 feet high with a court length of 94 feet. A football field is 100 yards long, and outdoor tracks are 400 meters around. Therefore, in other sports, the only difference is the venue. However, in cross country, the course has a significant role in the outcome of a race. 
Some courses are flat, meaning that there are not any hills, while other courses are hilly, meaning that there are several rolling hills. Runners tend to favor one type of course over the other. Also, times that are run on flatter courses are faster than times run on hilly courses. Being familiar with a course is paramount prior to competing on that course. A map of the course is usually sent in advance and a course walk or jog is usually held the day prior to the meet. The starting line has several names including boxes, lane assignments, post positions, and starting positions. But regardless which name you use, Teams line up with a four to seven person front on the starting line. Meat management determines the front size. The course route is usually marked with the grass being cut lower and with other markings like flags. Race umpires are posted throughout the course directing and checking the runners along the route. In bigger meets, the runners are escorted by either a golf cart or a bicycle. The finish line has a chute and is located close to the starting line. Also, at bigger meets, you'll see a camera with a chip timing mat along with a running clock. At championship meets, they get really fancy with archways and a ribbon. Since the course is so important to the outcome of a race, the first question most cross-country runners and coaches ask is, where is the meet? Most sports have tryouts to select their team. However, that concept is reversed for the sport of cross country. Most coaches must recruit runners for the team. The best place to start is with the track team distance runners who usually run cross country anyway. Athletes from other sports like basketball, soccer, wrestling, field hockey, tennis, swimming, and baseball are potential members. Several athletes have used cross country as a form of conditioning and then found out that they were better in cross country than they were in a primary sport. Physical education teachers are also very valuable because several outstanding runners have been discovered in gym class. The bottom line is this, most cross country coaches must recruit athletes for their team. Cross country training can be broken down into three phases, endurance, competition, and championship. The endurance phase is prior to the season during the months of July and August where the runners build an endurance space by increasing their weekly running mileage. The competition phase starts in September with the first meet and continues through October with more emphasis on speed work. The final phase is championship season in November where the runners should peak. Implementing the proper training is what separates good coaches from great coaches. Also, mental training is very important and should be done weekly. Being a spectator at a cross country meet is different than any other sporting event. First of all, there are not any seats and you must move around in designated areas of the course to see parts of the race. Many spectators only see the start and finish since they are in the same vicinity. Since each course is different, the coach can usually tell you the best place to watch the meet. Inner City Cross Country Exhibit A will examine Norfolk, Virginia's Norview High School cross country program for the entire 1970 decade. But first, let's go to the year 1960 when Norview High School cross country team won the district championship. They were led by 11th grader Jimmy Johnson, who finished second individually at the state meet. The next year in 1961, the Pilots won the district again, but most of all, won the state championship. Jimmy Johnson again led the Pilots and won the state title in a meet record. The Pilots were coached by William Garrison. These were Norview's top five runners. 58 years later, in 2019, this Norview boys team is still the only boys team from the south side of Virginia to win a boys team state title. Norview, 1970. I got introduced to cross country in September 1970 when my dad was in his third and final year as Norview's cross country coach. 
The team was full of newcomers due to the graduation of stars Chip Mallory, Bernard Carmichael, and Billy Wright. All three received full scholarships, Mallory to Appalachian State and the other two to Norfolk State. When Billy Wright signed in June 1970, he made history by becoming the first white person to receive a full athletic scholarship to the HBCU, Norfolk State University. Now, back to Norfolk's 1970 cross-country team, and one of the newcomers was Robert Bob Jennings, who only joined the team for a very unusual reason. Oh, and this is funny. They said you can make $5 on a Saturday if you run cross-country. So I said, hmm. And I already like to run. I said, let me go try that out. And then I met Coach Green and the rest is history. Wait a minute now. High school athletes are not allowed to get paid. They used to give you money for food on Saturday when we went to the way meet. <laughs> I went to some of the meets and sometimes helped with menial tasks. In 1970, the maximum distance for high school cross country was 2.5 miles. Teams ran mostly weekly dual meets, except for an occasional invitational on Saturdays. Today, teams rarely run dual meets, or if they do, it is part of a bigger meet with the teams just scoring their own runners. Teams usually run at the same location. For example, all teams in the Southeastern District run their weekly meets at Bell Mills Park in Chesapeake. But let's get back to the year 1970. The only time the district teams would come together would be at a district meet held at the Little Creek Amphibious Base Course. Again, dual meets were the thing, and each team had its own course, usually located near the school. The course distance varied at each school. In these seven meets, there were five different distances. This course was 2.3 miles. This one, 2.2. This one, exactly 2. This course was 2.1, along with this 2.41 and also a 2.5 mile course. This is the Wellington Oaks neighborhood today, which is located directly across the street from Norview High School. In 1970, this land was Norview's cross country course. Norview only had one home meet that season, and I was there. The meet was against Kellum High School, who had the area's best runner, and Dennis Costello, who was breaking different course records every week. Norview's course distance was 2.3 miles, and Costello shattered the record with an amazing winning time of 9 minutes and 35 seconds, which would have ranked high with the collegians. Bob Jennings finished second with a huge PR. As a matter of fact, every single runner that day had a huge PR, which prompted meet officials to investigate. It was discovered that a course umpire gave the wrong directions and one loop was not run. Therefore, the runners only ran 2 miles instead of 2.3 miles. Bob would go on to make all district by finishing 12th his sophomore year and qualify for regionals. Norview, 1971. Coach Harry Stevens would become Norview's cross country coach in the fall of 1971, and Bob would finish second in the district his junior year. My junior year, I came in second behind Chris Toulouse who went on to be a star at Wimmer Mary's. Norview, 1972. Even though Bob had finished second his junior year, he did not get any respect his senior year. Let's see how that made Bob feel. What made me mad was, as I read the papers, they never mentioned me as a favorite to win the Eastern District. They talked about guys from the beach. Bob would go on to win the Eastern District, nearly breaking the course record running in the rain and mud and made history by becoming the district's first black cross-country champion. It made me feel great. Bob will go on to Virginia State University. Norview, 1973. In September 1973, Coach Stevens told my dad that the district was having JV cross-country for the first time and asked him would I be interested in running since I was now in the eighth grade. I was reluctant because I was a basketball and baseball player. And I remember watching Bob and the rest of the team train and the pain that they endured. Anyway, I decided to run because I figured it would help me with my conditioning for basketball. I did okay that season, but I was glad when it was over. Norview, 1974. In 1974, the National Federation of High Schools 
increase the maximum distance of cross country to 3.1 miles, which is still the standard today for high schools. Also, the Eastern District started hosting their weekly dual meets at Little Creek Amphibious Base for the district teams. 1974 was also my ninth grade year, and again, I reluctantly went back to cross country. And I do mean reluctant, because now the distance had increased to 3.1 miles, and I hated a 2.5 mile course. Then, on the first day of practice, I saw two of my lifelong friends, Byron Cherry and Chris Jernigan. They were joining the team, and this is how they got introduced to cross country. Harry Stevens, I believe. It was during uh, middle school, and I believe at that time we had a race called the 600. 600 thank you. And uh, I did very well in that. And he sort of tapped me on the shoulder and said, you ever think about running cross country? I was in ninth grade. Chris Jernigan, he went out for this team and sort of running down Field Pass Road. You know, caught a scooter and thought I was on a bicycle. And I said, oh, okay, I think you can do this. And then I just kind of came out, started training, and, and started working with the guys. And that's how I really got involved with it. Now, I was really looking forward to running cross country. And then Coach Stevens told me that I would be running on the varsity, which really meant a lot to me. Also, I met Alfred Stink McGlone, who was in the 11th grade, but running cross country for the first time. Alan Kirkman. Alan Kirkman had me running to, which is called Piggly Wiggly now. We would run up there every day. And once we found out we had that, that stamina, we started running every day. And the team really bonded, especially when we went to Still Beach in Norfolk. Not the training part, but the swimming part afterwards. Now that was fun. However, like most inner city cross country teams, most of our training was done on hard surfaces. Also, traffic was a problem with several busy intersections, meaning lots of time spent running in place. Again, this was the first year high schools were allowed to run 3.1 miles. The course at Little Creek had to be adjusted to the longer distance, on the night before our first meet, I received some extra motivation when my dad told me my name would be in the newspaper if I finished in the top 10. There were about 25 to 30 runners in our trial meet against Maury and First Colonial. I finished second for Norview and ninth overall to make the newspaper in my very first varsity race. A couple of days later, it was discovered that the Little Creek course was a quarter mile short of 3.1 miles, but all results remained official. The course was lengthened to regulation, and we continued our season. I like running the Little Creek course because the entire course was flat and run on grass. District teams could also have two meets at other sites. Our second meet of the year was at Norview against Booker T. Washington, but our course was entirely roads and sidewalks. The start and finish line was directly across the street from Norview High School here at the corner of Field Potts Road and Sewell's Point Road then run straight down Field Potts Road and make a left turn on Sedgefield Drive, run all the way down, then return back to Norview. However, something happened to a Booker T runner on Sedgefield Drive. We have to stay with uh, Odie, so we kept a tight knit on him and we stayed behind him. And he pulled the way down Field Potts, tried to pull away him. He turned the corner, he got hit by the car. You know, it was... Um, and uh, me and me and Washington was right there when he got hit. He swung out to try to get uh, on the other side of the street, trying to get away from me and he watched. <laughs> and we was on his tail, but when he swung out, it was a car coming out of him. And a car hit him. O2 would go to the hospital to get treated for his injuries and actually returned a month later when we ran Booker T a second time, but this time at Little Creek. Another great bonding experience we had in 1974 was the bicycle ride. The bike ride. Bike ride. One Saturday, we rode our bicycles from Norview High School in Norfolk to the Oceanfront Boardwalk in Virginia Beach, which is about 22 miles each way. We were on bike ride going up. Can you get on Interstate? We get on Virginia's Boulevard. And so once once we got on Virginia's Boulevard, we take it all the way down to the to the boardwalk. Rode all the way to Virginia Beach, and it was a team effort. Everybody enjoyed it, and it was good exercise, and it was just fun. It was different. It was a great way to train. What I remember most though about the bike ride was on the way back, we stopped at this park named Mount Trashmore, which had just opened. Mount Trashmore was nothing but a dumping ground. It was a trash dumping ground. I mean, a huge hill that people see don't realize that that, that was trash. <laughs> that was nothing but trash. And so they turned to this big park. In 1974, Mount Trashmore Park only had a go-kart track and some picnic tables. It was bare. 
but today it is one of the most popular parks in the state of Virginia. Little did I realize at the time that I was going to be seeing a lot of this place for the next three years. I had a successful freshman year with all that fun, but the real fun was making the newspaper four out of a possible five times. Alan Kirkman was our number one runner the entire season, and my position varied from second runner to fifth runner. Also running varsity was Gary Crook and Lee Washington. Chris and I were the only freshmen to earn a varsity letter. Even though Byron, along with Philip Pittman, Byron Holloway, and Cleveland Arrington ran JV, we did the same workouts and considered ourselves one team. Norview, 1975. In 1975, the game changed when the course changed. The district moved the meets to Mount Trashmore Park. This meant running on a course with hills, and the difference between running on a flat course and a hilly course is like night and day. Our entire region is flat, however, this man-made mountain changed everything, including the way we trained. At the end of Field Potts Road is the Tidewater Drive overpass. Tidewater Drive covers the entire length of the city of Norfolk, starting downtown and ending in Ocean View. The overpass is in the middle of Tidewater Drive, about a mile from Norview High School. We used to train here at least once a week to simulate hill training. It helped, but there was no substitute for Mount Trashmore. That includes the Campus Cellar Bridge, which is twice as high as the Tidewater Drive overpass. The Campus Cellar Bridge connects the south side of Norfolk to the rest of the city near Norfolk State University. And to simulate hill training, Norfolk State Cross Country Team used to practice here. And club alum Ricky Mike was on their team and he says he remembers. Running over the bridge was very scary at first, but an awesome view. However, you must focus on looking straight ahead for obvious reasons. Now, back to Norview's 1975 Cross Country Team. We returned all six varsity lettermen from the previous season. Plus, Alan Kirkman's brother Reggie joined us to complete our top seven. Reggie played JV football the previous season, so let's add that sport to the list for potential athletes to run cross country. Also in 1975, Alfred McGlone, now a senior, and Reggie coached a youth football team during the season. In my senior year, I got involved in coaching recreation football. And I think I was like 17 to 18 years old. Watching the athletes that came through the program, the ones that came through the program, I get to watch a lot of them and it makes me proud that I've done something, something. I help these kids. And I've been doing that for a while. Doing it for a while is an understatement. Alfred Steen McGlone has been doing it for 44 years since 1975 and has helped a countless number of youths in the Tidewater area. We finished fourth in the district and became the first Norview team since 1969 to qualify for regionals. And at the fall sports banquet, Coach Stevens informed us that he would not be returning next season as our cross-country coach. He also told Chris Jernigan and me that he was expecting great things from us since we would be the only two returning varsity lettermen on the team next year. Norview, 1976. In 1976, our district became smaller due to a petition filed by the six Virginia Beach High School principals to the Virginia High School League. From 1969 through June of 1976, the Eastern Region of Virginia was composed of three districts. The Peninsula District was composed of the Hampton and Newport News High Schools. The Southeastern District was composed of the high schools from Chesapeake and Portsmouth. The Eastern District, which Norview was a member, was composed of the Norfolk and Virginia Beach High Schools. Advancing to the regional level was very hard and complicated at an Eastern District's principal meeting in October of 1975, the six Virginia Beach High School principals announced their intentions to the five Norfolk schools that they were going to petition the VHSL to start their own district. Better representation in Eastern Region matters was the reason given for the breakaway. Shortly thereafter, it became official when the Virginia High School League Legislative Council voted to allow the six Virginia Beach High Schools to break away from the Eastern District and formed their own, which they named the Beach District, with the six Virginia Beach high schools starting their district competition in September 1976. Since then, the Virginia Beach population has doubled and five more high schools have opened, bringing the membership total to 11 teams. 
The Eastern District currently has eight teams with the addition of the three Portsmouth high schools. Now, let's get back to Norview's 1976 cross-country season. Our new cross-country coach was Hamp Anderson. I knew Hamp very well since he had coached me the previous year in JV basketball. Hamp was also elevated to the varsity basketball coach the same time he became our coach, but he had no experience in coaching cross country. They needed a cross country coach, and I knew nothing about it. I was going in as a basketball coach, but I knew nothing about track or cross country. He pulled me to the side and told me all about how to do cross country. He said, I'll be around to help you with anything you need to know. And he said, plus uh, my son is uh, still on the team. And uh, he said, so you'll be all right. And sure enough, <laughs> you were the best thing on the team, of course. Hamp was very interested in learning the sport of cross country, and he would also confer with me sometimes about different types of workouts. The first thing Hamp did was make Chris Jernigan and me team captains. With graduation depleting our team, we received a big boost when all district runner Vernon Hayes transferred from Granby High School. Also, newcomers Anthony Antman Elliott, Barrett Monkman Walk, and Chris Foster joined the team. Antman simply liked to run, while Monkman was a wrestler and using cross country for conditioning. Chris Foster said, he joined to get in shape for basketball, but discovered he could actually run long distance. Some of the basketball players would condition with us sometimes, but run a much shorter distance. One of them, Mike Smith, became a member of the team and ran our last meet with us. I had a good season and even won a cross country race for the first time in my career. Our team finished third in the district and I also finished third individually. Booker T. Washington's Tim Jones was the district champion, and Tim was also one of the country's top 800-meter runners. Chris Jernigan finished fourth in the district, and Vernon Hayes finished 10th to make all district. However, cross country is a team sport, and our fourth and fifth runners finished 18th and 26th, respectfully, for our 61 points. Maury won the meet with 56 points, and Granby finished second with 57, so we just missed out. We got revenge, though, the next week at regionals when we smashed Maury by 102 points and Granby by 55. We were already talking about the next season since our entire team was returning. 1977 was going to be Norview's cross-country year. Norview, 1977. In the summer of 1977, Chris Jernigan, Vernon Hayes, Marty Stark, and I competed in the Tidewater Striders All-Comers Weekly Meets that were held at Indian River High School in Chesapeake. Chris had a car and we rode with him. We usually won our age group each week. Vernon in the 120 yard dash. Yes, the all district cross country runner Vernon Hayes was a 9.9 .9 sprinter in the 100 yards. Chris in the 440 yard dash. I was in the 880 and the mile. And Marty in the long and triple jump. Marty didn't run cross country but he was an all-state jumper and an important member of our track team. The Tidewater Striders in the early 1970s were a track club, then became a running club in the late 1970s. Today, they are one of the nation's largest running clubs. We started cross-country practice in August, and we had two goals. First, to win the district championship, and second, to qualify for the state meet, which meant we had to finish in the top four at the regional meet. Look. I'm going to keep this real. If we did not achieve both of the goals with the team that we had on paper, then something must have gone extremely wrong because we certainly were not going to choke. Let's see what the team looks like on paper. We were returning three all-district runners, and Ant-Man and Chris Foster continued to train and made all-district and track. Also, newcomer Keith Do-Man Do was all-district in the mile, and he could really run. Byron Cherry was also in the mix, and basketball player Mike Smith had race experience from the previous year. Two other basketball players were running well in practice and trying to make the top seven. They were Nate Leary and Vernon Bruce Bell. Bruce and I had won three championships in basketball and were teammates for six straight years, starting in 1971 with the Bucks basketball team, 
then a championship squire team in 1972, another championship squire team in 73. We played for the squires in 1974 and with the pros in 1975 and concluded with a co-championship JV basketball team in 1976, coached by our cross-country coach, Hamp Anderson. So I knew Bell had heart and was athletic, but most of all, he knew how to win. However, this was his first year running, and we had a veteran team. Cracking the top seven was going to be tough for him. This is the reason he ran cross country. Uh, once I found out the season was starting, I got in line to sign up. My three previous seasons started with a major change. Freshman year, they increased the distance to 3.1 miles. Then the next year, the course was moved to Mount Trashmore. In my junior year, the district was revised. Thankfully, there were not any changes to begin my senior year, and things were looking great for the team at the start of the season. Peace and quiet. Then the storm came. Actually, it was a tornado because it blew me away. About a week before our first meet, Vernon Hayes had an accident at the KFC where he worked and will be out for the season. Then... Chris Jernigan got injured in practice and was also going to miss the entire season. I was devastated. We had just lost two of our best runners that were not replaceable. Chris and I had run together since ninth grade, and Chris was money. He always ran his best races in the big championship meets. His ninth grade year, he finished eighth, and then his tenth grade year, he finished sixth and even beat our number one runner, Alan Kirkman. Then his junior year, he finished fourth. Vernon Hayes was also money in big meets. He earned all district both of the years he had run cross country. Anyway, this is what we now look like on paper. And now we only had one goal, which was to win the Eastern District Championship. The other goal, to qualify for the state meet, was not realistic without Chris Jernigan and Vernon Hayes. We finished the regular season undefeated. Keith Du, Ant-Man, and I were the top three runners, with Chris Foster being our number four runner. The fifth runner rotated between three basketball players, Mike Smith, Nate Leary, and Bruce Bell. These were our top seven runners that would compete at the Eastern District meet. For us to win the district, we needed our fifth runner to finish no lower than 18th. When I got to the locker room on championship day, I saw that Bruce Bell had shaved his head bald for the occasion. I shaved my head before the race because it was just something I wanted to do. It was something different. Uh, at that time, bald heads were not popular at all. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, it felt good. And, you know, I performed well. I, I, I don't think that had nothing to do with it. It was a rainy day and the course was very muddy. Well, off we went. Maurice Lee Hurl and I battled for the individual title, but he was the better man that day. And I faded the fourth place. My teammate Keith Dew finished second, and Ant-Man and Chris Foster finished fifth and tenth, respectfully. However, the biggest question was, what place did our fifth runner finish? I placed 14th. I was the fifth place runner that brought home the uh, championship. With Bell's 14th place finish, our team score total was 35 points, and we beat Maury to become Eastern District Champions which was Norview's first cross-country championship since the legendary 1961 team. We were also the first all-black cross-country team to win a district title in the Eastern Region. We celebrated hard, all of us, including Vernon Hayes and Chris Jernigan. Wait, that's, we were all a team. Whether you ran that day or didn't run or whatever, we were all a team. And that's what I remember and love about our team, that we were all a team. We cheered each other on. This is how winning the championship made Coach Hamp Anderson feel. Like I was on top of the world. <laughs> These are the other members of the team that were not in the top seven, but were important members of the team. Ronald Webster, Hatley Evans, Craig Caldwell, and of course my lifelong friend, Byron Cherry. Today, Byron is a retired Army Colonel and former rector of the Board of Visitors for his alma mater, North State University. He also has his own business, which is aptly named Succeed to lead. Well, to see the lead, what we do, we are, we're big in the cybersecurity space, in the IT space. We do a lot of cybersecurity. Norview, 1978. I graduated in June of 1978 and was now running cross country for Virginia State University. However, with a complete new team, 
Norview won the district again in 1979, and of course I was there to root them on and celebrate with the team. The team was led by brothers Dave and Roderick Burke, along with two runners with flashy nicknames, Crazy Luke and the $6 million man, who real names were Stanley Walden and Jason Mitchell, respectfully. Winning the individual title that year was Booker T. Washington's Harry Freeman, who we will discuss later. Norview, 1979. In 1979, the Virginia High School League approved girls cross country and girls started competing in Virginia for the first time. Kempsville High School girls team of Virginia Beach won the first state championship led by individual winner Kendall Tater. Kempsville girls is the only girls team from the south side of Virginia to win a state team title, which puts them in the elite category with the 1961 Norview Boys state championship cross country team. But let's get back to the 1979 Norview Boys team, which was returning its entire squad. Then the team got a tremendous boost when basketball player Reuben Clark discovered he could run during preseason basketball conditioning. Reuben ran outdoor track the previous spring and finished second in the mile to Harry Freeman. Reuben was a natural. Yeah, Reuben was a natural. He was just, yeah, well, I can't say anymore. He was just a natural. He had come out for the basketball team, but in running prior to the season, in training, like I was telling you about for the back, I saw how well he could run. And I told him about uh, cross country, and he did. The rest was history. He just was a natural. The team set a high goal of qualifying for the state meet like we had two years earlier, which meant they had to finish in the top four at the regional meet. Reuben Clark won every race during the regular season and was the individual district champion. He also finished second at the regional meet and led Norview to a fourth place finish, which qualified them for the state meet. This was also the Eastern Regional's first all-black cross-country team to qualify for the state meet. Even though Hamp was a basketball coach, his cross-country resume was very impressive with two district championships and one state qualifying team in three years. This concludes the 1970 decade, but here is some more cross-country information from some inner-city runners. Back to the 1978 champion, Harry Freeman. Harry only ran one year of varsity cross-country even though he ran JV in 1974 when the course was still at Little Creek. He did very well in JV and finished third at the city meet, but did not run again until 1978. Harry would go on to be an All-American at St. Augustine College under the legend George Williams, the 2004 Olympic coach. Harry also had a very impressive resume being an assistant track coach on several of St. Aug's national championship teams. Moreover, Harry would become the first and still the only coach from a historically black college university to receive the United States Track and Cross Country Coaches Association Regional Cross Country Coach of the Year Award. The 1979 Eastern District Champion, Reuben Clark, would join me at Virginia State and have an outstanding career winning several CIAA titles and becoming an All-American. Additionally, Reuben was inducted into the Virginia State University Hall of Fame for his meritorious performance in both track and cross country. Meet the 1980 Eastern District Cross Country Champion, Donald Bond from Norfolk's Lake Taylor High School. This is how he started running cross country. After riding a bit my junior year in football, I ran a meet to be the fifth person on the team. I'd never ran cross country in my life. I ran 17-10 at Trashmore. So the following year, I trained in the summertime. Bond would join her Freeman at St. Aug and have an outstanding college career. Today, at age 56, he is still running and winning awards on the road running circuit. However, Donald Bond's biggest contribution to the sport has come as a coach. He has coached both Hampton University and Norfolk State University cross country teams to several MEAC titles. Upon coaching cross country, I came across a lot of kids who didn't have a lot of talent and they did well as long as you put the work in. Also, in the late 1980s, the best distance runner from a Norfolk public high school was discovered by Bob Jennings. That runner name was Joe King. This is how Bob 
discovered Joe. Joe King was playing basketball in the gym, and for some reason, I was over at Norview, and I approached him and said, are you gonna play basketball? He said, yeah, that's what I wanna do. I said, if you run cross country, you'd be in shape for basketball. I said, why don't you come out and just try it? So he came out, and the rest is history. Joe was a natural born runner. I mean, his he could run. I had never seen anybody in Norfolk run like Joe King. It was so effortless for him. Joe would become a two-time state champion in the mile while at Norview and later compete for St. Aud where he won several national titles. Joe also competed professionally. Let's fast forward to the year 1991. In part three of this film, we explain the startup of Norfolk Real Deer Track Club in June 1991 with charter members Jennifer Williams, Tanya Williams, and Tamina Daniels. In November of 1991, we had our first boys members when we started a cross-country team. Salem's Mike Brown, Maurice Marlon Hurst, Booker T. Washington's John Zimmerman, and Granby High's Scott Murphy were some of our first members. Then, to recruit more members, I contacted over 100 coaches through mail, faxes, flyers, and in person. Only four coaches responded. The four coaches were Al Dorner, then coaching at Denby High School and a former state meet director. He also has a cross-country meet named in his honor. Also responding was Ken Lampert, who has been coaching at Norfolk Academy for over 30 years and is still coaching at Norfolk Academy, running a first-class program while hosting many cross-country and track and field events. The third coach was Western Branches, Wade Williams, a track genius, who will be featured in part six of this film. And the fourth coach is legend Bill Bernard, who has been coaching at Kellum High School for over 30 years and is still running an outstanding program for the Knights in addition to coaching several elite athletes. Coach Bernard was an outstanding runner at Baldwin Wallace College. This is how he got involved with running. My first involvement was as a a freshman in high school and as skinny as I am I really started out playing football and I broke my arm and was a, unable to participate in football. I started as a freshman miler and, and I showed potential. Prior to coaching at Kellum High School, Coach Bernard headed the New Energy Group of the Tidewater Striders Running Club. New Energy consisted of youths ages 17 and under. Through Coach Bernard's guidance, several youths excel and later receive athletic scholarships, including state champion John Hunt. You know, we're talking about cross country now. Um, you know, I people didn't really understand cross country, and they it's, they still don't to some respects because of the score. You know, they look at the score, the the you know the lowest score wins. Coach Bernard certainly understands the sport and has coached a plethora of champions in his 30-plus years at Kellum High School, including cross-country state champ Natalie Sherbach, who was the Female Athlete of the Year in 2004, along with state indoor record holder in the mile, Bobby Peavy. Now back to the year 1991. In the fall of 1991, Virginia did not have AAU cross-country, so I contacted the AAU National Office. Larry Wilson, the AAU national chairman at the time, asked me if I wanted to start a program in Virginia, which I did and became Virginia's first AAU cross-country chairman. We hosted the first Virginia AAU championship on November the 16th, 1991 at Mount Trashmore Park. We had over 60 athletes ages 8 through 18, including two Norfolk Rio Deal boys teams, one in the 15-16 age group, and the other team was in the 17-18 age group. The Tidewater Striders were also a big help, especially Dan Edwards, who was now the youth coordinator for the Striders. We took our 15-16 age group team to the AAU Nationals in Birmingham, Alabama, thanks to the city of Norfolk, who provided us with a van and a driver. At Friday's opening ceremony, 
I was elated to see that the guest speaker was Dave Wattle. Lane three, Dave Wattle with the golf cap from the United States. This is Dave in the white cap, and just watch this. Listen to this last hundred, two hundred meters. Stand by for the kick of Dave Waddle. If he's got it, he could make it. But he's going to catch Arjana and the Kenyans. And here he comes. This is the bid for a gold medal of Dave Waddle. He's got one Kenyan. I think he's going to get it. Of course, they showed this footage at the ceremony, and Dave got a standing ovation prior to his speech. Our team did good, finishing eighth out of 34 teams, and Mike Brown became our first All-American with his ninth place finish. In part three of this film, we also learned the reason I volunteered to compile track listings for the local newspaper, the Virginia Pilot. New sports editor Chick Rebo arrived in June 1992 with an emphasis on local sports. So in order to get more recognition for the sport of cross country, I approached Chick with an idea of ranking cross country runners for the newspaper. I gave him a top 10 list for the boys and girls, and then Chick asked me, wouldn't it be better if we had a poll using other coaches and what I thought other coaches would say? I answered his questions, and Chick told me he would look into my poll, but was not sure they would use it. Then, three days later, while reading a sports section, I, no pun intended, ran across my cross-country rankings. I then called Chick, and he told me that they had decided to use my rankings and for me to fax them every Monday. One of the things we were trying to do, we were trying to figure out ways to ramp up the high school stuff, and we had to realign the troops we had, look at what you needed to do. And me, I've always believed in things like rankings and all-star teams because it just adds more credibility to your coverage, and it's a big deal for the kids to be ranked number one or number ten and, and see you and say, I should be number seven, <laughs> you know. And uh, when I was at the pilot in the 70s as a high school writer, I did the wrestling rankings and That's forever, right. yes. ever sorting out who, you know, oh, I should be number one. Okay, go out and beat him, and then you'll be number one. So anyway, in that context, we wanted to do more things like that, but we just did not have the expertise in the staff because nobody was out there. Nobody was doing this stuff at the time. Remember now, this was the pre-internet era where you could not just go to a site and click on a link and get results. The results from races were mailed out a week later. However, I will get the results myself and write them down when the results were posted on the wall at meets. If I could not make a meet, I would get a coach or somebody else to write them down for me. Gathering results was sometimes complicated but necessary to have an accurate ranking because coaches and runners would tell me that they should be ranked or ranked higher. I had a complicated system which converted times run on different courses along with juxtaposing performances and individual meets to dual meets. All of this was done manually, but since then, my system has been computerized. At the 1992 Eastern Regional Cross Country Meet, I almost got a perfect score when 9 out of the 10 ranked runners qualified for state. I will continue to rank runners for the newspaper for 5 more years and it definitely brought more exposure to cross country. In October of 2001, with the internet in full effect, high school student Brandon Miles started milestat.com, which was like my rankings on steroids, but more informative. Milestat is now part of the Miles Split Network and is the most informative source for high school track and cross country. Back to 1992. We again hosted the Virginia AAU Cross Country Championships. The AAU Nationals that year were held in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia. We took a very strong team and finished second at the Nationals, led by three All-Americans. Robert Leone, who finished fourth, Mike Brown, who finished seventh, and Derek Redman, who finished ninth. Also competing on the runner-up team was standout baseball player Chris Libby, All-State pole vaulter Bobby Wilson, along with Ryan Smith, Billy Edwards, and William Leggett. In 1993, for the third straight year, we hosted the Virginia AAU Cross Country Championships. However, notice the additional club, Atlantic Coast, and we will thoroughly explain the name change in Part 5. The AAU Nationals were in San Antonio, Texas, and we had another strong team 
with Mike Brown and Robert Leone, along with state AA champion Howard Townsend, who had qualified for the Foot Locker Finals a week earlier. Townsend would go on to become our first and only AAU cross-country individual champion by running away from the field and won by 23 seconds to lead us to a third-place finish. Mike Brown finished fourth with Robert Leone and Scott Murphy finished 19th and 21st respectfully. We received a nice reception at the airport when we returned. Howard Townsend would also go on to finish 14th the following week at the Foot Locker Nationals. Before we continue with the club's 1994 season, let's examine Inner City Cross Country Exhibit B, which is the 1994 and 95 Maury High School Cross Country Program. In 1994, I was selected to coach both Maury boys and girls cross country teams. I was familiar with the girls team since I had been Maury's girl coach for two years, so let's start with the 1994 girls team. Prior to the 1994 season, no girls team from the Eastern District had made it to the state meet, but I knew we had a good chance to go. Again, the top four teams from the regional qualify for the state meet. We already had a strong team with seniors Jane Lawrence and Aisha Joyner, along with junior Sarah Fru. Tennis player Jennifer Warren and soccer player Courtney Dozier were good also. Track star Denzel Seal was also going to break into the top seven. Then the team received another boost with two transfers. Catherine Kitt Weaver transferred from the perennial power West Potomac and Mary Malone transferred from California. Our goals were to win the Eastern District, but most of all, to make history by qualifying for the state meet. Prior to the season, we had a setback when our projected number three runner, Sarah Fru, did not run due to personal reasons. However, we were still very deep and had an excellent chance to qualify for states. The girls team had an outstanding regular season and teams from other districts knew that this Norfolk team was going to be one to watch at regionals. Jane led the way the entire season and won her third straight district individual title. We had a pretty tight knit group anyway in cross country. Our team scored a perfect score of 15 points and our runners finished first through seventh at our Eastern District meet. Before we see how our team fared at regionals, let's meet Morris 1994 boys team. Our boys team returned three runners. Dallas DJ Williams, who had just completed an outstanding summer running with the track club. The other two runners were Jake Hughes and Chris Coffin. As mentioned earlier, you must have at least five runners for a complete team. However, I knew there were two brothers who were twins who still attended Mora and had run track two years earlier, but did not run the previous spring. I also knew that if I could convince them to run, we would have a chance because running was their mode of transportation. What we were capable of doing at, a, at an early age, it became natural that you went from place to place, you know, on foot. And we would run Brother Francis challenging the bus three miles away, knowing that it had several stops and we would pass it when it stopped at a certain stop and around the corner and it was from back and forth all the way. And we made sure that we made that three mile distance back to the corner by our house before the school bus did. Meet Daryl and Francis Wood. They were not your average high school students. Since age 16, they had lived on their own, going to school and working. Sometimes they had to donate blood to pay bills or for food money. Another time, they lived two months without electricity, and when they got home from school, they did their homework as fast as possible before the sun went down. They also bought foods that did not need to be cooked. After convincing them to join the team, we now had a competitive team, and then we received another boost when Leon Henry transferred from Norview High School. Leon was an 800 meter runner, but had run with the track club for two summers. We now had three very strong runners, along with three good runners. We added four more runners to the team, with John Frank emerging as our seventh runner. Led by DJ, Daryl, and Fran, the team swept through the regular season en route to winning the district championship. Also. Fourth runner Leon Henry and fifth runner Jake Hughes had vastly improved to give us five solid runners, but more importantly, a realistic chance to qualify for the state meet. The last Eastern District boys team to qualify for the state meet was Norview's 1979 team 15 years earlier. All of our district meets were held at Mount Trashmore, but the regional meet was at Newport News Park, which is a flat course. In Cross Country 101, I mentioned the importance of being familiar with the course. So to familiarize ourselves 
we sometimes practice there along with running the Newport News Invitational Meet. Practicing the course you're actually going to run, whatever that is. And then we drove out to Newport News Park because um, that was our regional course. The boys races run first, followed by the girls race 30 minutes later. So let's start with the boys team. DJ, Daryl, and Fran always finish within 15 seconds of each other. To finish in the top four and qualify for the state meet, I calculated that 120 points would place the team in the top four. I knew that DJ and the twins would all finish in the top 20, but we needed Jake and Leon to both finish 38th or lower. Additionally, I knew that Great Bridge and Minchville were going to finish first and second, leaving four teams, Kellum, Cox, Gloucester, and us competing for two spots. I also knew it was going to be very close, so I set up a system to get the results immediately after the race ended. The system worked like this. I got five members from the girls team who were not competing to record the results of every finisher from those four teams to compute team scores. These are the actual notes and they were identical to the official results. This is how we finished. 12th place, 16th place, 17th place, 38th place, and 40th place for a total of 123 points. So I knew we were close. And then Lisa Joyner, one of the five recorders, told me that the boys team were state qualifiers because we had finished third with 123 points to fourth place Gloucester's 124 points. The other recorders were Cassell Person, Amy Weisberg, Alice Shahan, and Katie Connors, who will later be the district individual champion in 1997. So I knew my boys team had qualified for the state meet before the girls race even started. And thank goodness there was less drama on the girls' side where we were projected to finish third, and that's exactly where we finished. But more importantly, we made history by becoming the first Eastern District girls' team to qualify for the state meet. Both my boys and girls' team had qualified for states. This was one of the happiest days of my life when I was holding those two third-place trophies. Hey, it is still one of the happiest days of my life. And isn't it ironic how Newport News Park had gone full circle with me starting in 1970 with Bob Jennings and completing the circle in 1994 with my Mari Cross Country teams. 1994 was the first year the state meet was held at the Great Meadows course in Warrington, Virginia. And 25 years later, this site is still hosting the Virginia state meet. The state's a completely different story. So competition is totally different. But great experience. I remember being real sunny and it was nice and it was pretty coarse, you know, very open compared to what we would have around here. Our girls and boys team finished 13th and 14th respectfully at the state meet to cap off an outstanding year. Jane will go on to run for the University of Virginia while Daryl recently retired from the Navy. Fran will retire from the Army next month in December 2019. Norview's 1979 boys team and Morris 1994 boys team are the only Eastern District boys team in the last 43 years to qualify for the state meet. And Daryl Wood has mixed feelings about this accomplishment. I am proud to have been part of that team, but what we set out to do that year was to set a benchmark, set uh, the stage for what other runners in this area could do. I remember when we started off the season, that was the, the goal out in the distance, but we had goals set up to get us there. And that's what we focused on. So when we accomplished that, for all of us, I think as a team, it felt like we were setting the stage for those that were going to come behind us to show them, hey, it's been done. It can be done again. That's, I think, where my disheartening comes from is because it's been done, there is no reason that any runner out there right now cannot repeat that. It's been done. The work, the work has to be put in to get there. But it's feasible. It's, it's possible. This headline reads, Coach turned more runners into believers. But they left out the last three words, in hard work. The kids deserve the credit because they are the ones that made it happen. In Cross Country 101, we learn through proper training, the runners will peak when it counts in championship season. We worked hard in practice, and I let them know the reason for each workout. I really emphasize practice and let them know that this is where the meets are won. They believed in the hard work and it paid off. Additionally, we had weekly mental training, which was very beneficial. 
I also took input from the team, allowing them to fully express themselves, and they did not hold back. This is how some of them start. The only thing, sometimes it seems as, I feel that every single concern was addressed, and knowing your athletes is very important. Last but not least, I will consult with other area coaches to refine my training techniques, primarily track genius Wade Williams, who was also my track mentor, who you will meet in part six. In 1995, Sarah Fru returned, and even though she missed out on making history in 1994, she was determined to make her own history in 1995. I ran with um, was named Jane Lawrence, and she was really, really competitive, and she was always number one, always first, and I wanted to be like her. So I followed her and ran with her, and eventually I was almost just as fast as her. <laughs> Sarah Frew was a 1995 Eastern District individual champion. And with newcomers Emily Kirsch and Sarah Grady, along with veterans Jennifer Warren, Courtney Dozier, Kit Weaver, and Amy Weisberg, the Moy girls team won the Eastern District Championship and finished fourth at regionals to earn another state berth. It will be 23 years before another Eastern District girls team will qualify again for the state meet. Let's flash back to the 1977 Tyrell Destriders all come a meet because it reads like a who's who of track and cross country. Winston Brown has coached Fort Union to numerous state titles and was featured on an HBO segment about his family, which included guardianship of the Lamont brothers. Irvin Joseph has coached for over 30 years and is a well-known starter. Calvin Freeman, my college teammate, is another 30-year coach and vet and is currently at Bryan and Stratton. Steve Sawyer was an outstanding coach and runner. Moreover, I ran against him my freshman year when he was the Eastern District Champion. You met Ken Lampert earlier, and now let's meet Randy Cook, who is in his 70s and still winning. Also, Randy competed in one of the most grueling events, the 24-hour relay, where the goal is to run the most miles, one mile at a time, in 24 hours. It was like in the middle of June. At 6 p.m. on a Friday night and it went to 6 on Saturday. We were young and crazy. There were military teams there as well. We would warm up a half mile or something before it's your turn, run as hard as you could, and hand off to the next guy. On Friday and on Saturday, it got up to 100 degrees. And I found that much more difficult than a marathon because we couldn't sleep. Really couldn't eat much because every 40 minutes or so, you, know, you have to get back up and stretch. Uh, Team-wise, we ran uh, it was 261 miles. Back to the club's cross-country program. In 1994, we hosted our fourth straight Virginia AAU cross-country championship, and the AAU Nationals were held in Hammond, Indiana. Felicia McCray and Jane Lawrence earned All-American. That was super cool because it's nationals. You know, you feel like out of some of the top runners in the country, you did a pretty good job, and I proudly hold on to those still. In 1995, nationals were held in Joplin, Missouri, and Chris Beck earned All-American with his fifth-place finish. 1996 took us to Cleveland, Ohio for nationals, which were held in 20-degree weather. But in 1997, we competed in 80-degree weather, in Orlando, Florida, for Nationals. Also assisting with the cross-country program was Coach Butch Caldwell, a Charter Boys team member, and Coach Dave Jacobs, who also coached Grambage Delano Hurst, who was the 1997 Eastern Regional Champion, and also a club member. Finishing second at the Regionals was another club member, Princess Zan Kevin Rue, who was later the Atlanta 10 Conference 1500-meter champion while running for the University of Richmond. Kevin is also a very successful high school coach at his alma mater, Princess Anne. We discontinued the cross-country team after that year due to the fact that many elite cross-country runners were now just running Foot Locker or Nike Team Nationals. However, in 2006, club alum Aurora Scott finished second at the Foot Locker Nationals and also made the USA Junior Cross-Country Team. Club alum Mike Brown and Howard Townsend both had outstanding careers at the College of William & Mary, leading the team to a qualifying berth at the 1997 NCAA Cross Country Championships, where they competed against two legends, Mev and Bernard Lagat, who in 2019, 22 years later, are still competing today.
Mike Brown and Howard Townsend were also named to the Colonial Athletic Conference 25th Anniversary Cross Country Team. In Part 5, we will return to the track for years 4 through 9 of the track journey 